again and uh, talking about poetry, uh, specifically about an Eastern Township's poet. And this one uh, is uh, Ralph Gustafsson, uh, who, um, well the interesting thing about Ralph Gustafsson of course, all of the Eastern Township's poets or poets who have resided in the Eastern Townships that we have thus far uh, talked about, I say we, that's a royal we, me in particular. You know, None of them were born in the Eastern Townships, which is interesting. But um, Ralph Gustafson actually was born in the Eastern Townships. And, uh, and um, he was born in Lime, uh, Lime Ridge. And, uh, huh? Lime Ridge? Well, the question then becomes, where's Lime Ridge? You pull out your topo map and there's no such place. And, uh, but it's interesting, two weeks ago, before I found out where Lime Ridge was, I was uh, taking my Sunday afternoon jaunt exploring the Stoke Mountains and I was driving up around the back of the Stoke Mountains and there was this immense industrial complex with a sort of seven, eight, nine, ten story tower, right? Everything was a, a long sort of industrial sheds, bright white, okay? And then there were signs all over the hillside saying dynamitage, dynamiting, right? And I looked at these sort of things. And you know, I've been living here for 40 years on and off. Like, what in the name of are these, right? And it's a gigantic lime uh, mine with a huge 10 story lime kiln. Right? And that is where Lime Ridge was. And in fact, the uh, Lime Ridge was essentially there on the railway line, presumably to ship lime, you know, out to the United States, to Montreal, to Quebec. And essentially what happened is the mine grew and grew and grew and ate Lime Ridge. So that's what happened to Lime Ridge, right? Now, that's where uh, Ralph, who was the son of a, a Swedish immigrant, Carl um, Gustafsson, was born. And in a sense, you could say, well, he was born in the boonies, right? But actually, maybe not, you know. The thing is, when you think about it, when he was born, 1912, I think you said, Christian, when he was born, uh, the, the townships was... Um, <laughs> Well, there was uh, as much economic, if not more economic, activity there than there is today. Uh, primarily, also, there was, of course, it was much um, more decentralized of the towns. There was a lot more going on. So he, he wasn't kind of born in the boonies. He would have been born in a, a fairly active town, albeit it got eaten by a mine. You know? he, he moved, I think, pretty young to Sherbrooke. His dad, by the way, was a photographer which is interesting. Now, if you were a photographer in 1912, I mean, you must have been a bit of a techie. I mean, you must have been, it's sort of probably being like a computer guy today. And so his dad was a pretty sophisticated guy and apparently a pretty good pianist, which has its repercussions later on for, for, uh, for, 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 for Ralph. Anyway, so he moves to Sherbrooke, right? And, uh, and I think that dad had a photography shop right on Wellington Street when Wellington Street was, you know, a going concern, right, before they built Cod 4 and stuff like that. And, uh, and Ralph went to Bishop's, right, and he was, uh, 
he was a smart guy at Bishops. He was, in fact, for his MA, which was on Shelley and Keats, right, he, um, he won the uh, Governor General's Medal as the best student at Bishops, right, so. Of course, Bishops, well, Bishops are small today, right, about 1,200, 1,600 students in those days. It was still, I guess, close to its, um, uh, it wasn't at that time a theological college anymore, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the, the, the echo of its theological uh, juvenile, you know, his theological youth was still on it. So it probably wasn't very big, but nevertheless, he was the, he the top student, right, anyway. So, and then he went from there to Oxford. He did an MA at Bishops. He did a year at Oxford. I don't know if he had a Rhodes Scholarship or not. I'm not sure about that. And, uh, but once he went to Oxford, uh, once he got a BA at Oxford, he came back for one year. He taught in Eastern Ontario somewhere, maybe Brock. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm not sure where he taught in Eastern Ontario. Went to London, lived in London, then went to New York, right? Lived in New York for a long time and didn't come back to Canada permanently until I think it was about 1963, 61 or 63. So he spent most of his youth abroad in England and, and in, um, in the United States, which is also um, irrelevant here. Okay, now, I'd like to... Ralph Gustav as a poet is an interesting poet, you see, because there are a number of kind of factors, a number of... Um, motifs, a number of uh, aspects of his, uh, of his technique uh, which are, uh, which, which are uh, reflective of the conflicts and the crises in 20th century poetry. I'll read the, um, I'll read the, um, the recommendations, I believe I can on the back, if I if I brought the wrong book, I will just have to, um, I'll have to invent them, sort of rephrase them. I think I did bring them. He had many books, say, like 20 to 30 books. Oh, here we go. Look. Ralph Gustav, this is on the back of um, uh, his Winter Prophecies, right? Ralph Gustav, excuse me, Ralph Gustafson's poetry has been drawing praise of this kind, etc. Quote, Gustafsson writing is exquisite, the Globe and Mail. One cannot fail to recognize how solidly in the center of Canadian poetry he stands, George Woodcock, the sage of the West Coast. His voice has achieved resonance and passion and inventiveness and wit that place him as one of the great living poets. Robert Skelton, the Malahat Review. Great kudos. But I think there's an echo to them of overstriving. You know, it's sort of like, uh, in other words, I think, I think you could pick this up. That this is my view, but I think it's accurate. They're responding to another view of him, right? You see that maybe there might be a portion, you know, of the poetry world, uh, establishment, uh, anti-establishment, who thinks different. So that's why they're sort of going out of the way to give him six stars instead of five, right? And that's what's interesting about him, you see, because, and here we, here we can say, I was talking about Dudek and I was talking a bit about, you know, some of the theory and some of the conflicts and some of the issues in 20th century Canadian poetry. And they pertain to Gustafsson. In fact, Gustafsson and Dudek, certainly Dudek at times, looked at Gustafsson with somewhat squinny eyes, right? And this is the backstory. The backstory is Gustafsson comes from here, right? And Gustafsson's a country boy. His dad's a photographer, right, in Sherbrooke, which of course was a, you know, a, fa a fairly lively town. But it, it ain't the big city. It ain't the metropolis, right? And nearby, in the big metropolis, Montreal, which at that time is the cultural capital of Canada, not only French cultural capital of Canada, but the English cultural capital of Canada, right? Modernism, the whole new shift of sensibility, which has already occurred in France and England and other parts of Europe, is just beginning to manifest itself in the 1920s and 30s and 40s among the young students at McGill i.e., you know, A.G. Uh, Louis Dudek, A.G.M. Smith, 
uh, John Sutherland, you know, all of these people. And here we have Ralph Gustafsson down here, right, in Sherbrooke, right, who at the age of whatever, 21 or 22, he did come under some poetic influence of Bishop. The only other poet, apart from a couple of uh, poets in the 19th century, only other poet in the Sherbrooke or in the Eastern Township who had any reputation whatsoever taught at Bishop's. And certainly his name was um, Call, Call, C A W -L, L. And certainly he influenced uh, Ralph Gustafsson. But Ralph, get to, to get back to my track, Ralph Gustafsson goes to school here, goes to Oxford. He's, he's a country boy, he's a parochial, has a bit of a kind of an inferiority complex. And he goes to England and he starts, essentially he falls under the influence of traditional romantic Victorian English poetry. Now, you know, I, I sort of explained to you what romantic Victorian English poetry, certainly romantic poetry was like. I read you uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were dealing with, actually it's pre-romantic, but it anticipates the romantic. We were looking at Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard, right? So rhyming, strict meter, form, order, regu reg reg regularity, etc., and a very idealized version of the world. That was essentially what um, what uh, uh, Gustafsson learnt at Oxford, you see. So he comes back essentially having learnt that, you know, with all of its conventions, and he comes back into a Canadian environment. By the way, the Canadian, the traditional Canadian environment he came into, right, the, the conventional accepted Canadian post tended to write that way too, right? But he comes back into an environment where that crust is being broken by the new guys, by the young rebels, right? So he's sort of behind the times, right, writing in, in romantic rhetoric. And, uh, and uh, his whole career, to some degree, you know, was essentially um, uh, characterized by a struggle, you know. And there's no doubt about it, he did struggle quite hard, struggle to, 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 to emerge, right, from this kind of 19th century romantic, romantic sensibility with its, with its regular meters and its conventions and its idealization and its specialized language, right? And you know what the language is like of the 19th century, the literary language of the 19th century. It's very sort of sesquipedalian, it's Latinate, you know, it's sort of kind of sort of, you can't say, you can't sort of say, hey kid, let's, uh, let's when we finish dinner, let's go, let's go to the back room and play a game of pool, huh? You don't say that sort of thing. You sort of say sort of, you know, let's retire after our dinner, you know, for a post-prandial game of billiards or something like that. You know, it's a completely different sort of language, right, you see. And, uh, and, and in fact, um, because of this, uh, uh, Gustafsson's early poetry is, is almost, uh, at least, you know, actually I was sort of raised with an English education, so I, I may have more ease at, uh, at deciphering it than others, right? But his, his poetry is, is extremely um, abstract, sesquipedalian, etc., 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 right? And actually, I, I have one here that. I'll read you one of them. This is a, one of his first, his first book was called The Golden, I think it was The Golden Bowl, right? And um, it was woo, you know, I mean, it was full of um, classical mythology, right? And, um, which is great, but, you know, um, uh, the average guy on the street doesn't know much classical mythology, then or now, right? And, and the sort of language, uh, and influenced by individuals whose language was um, very, um, their technique was very elaborate, um, uh, very, um, very literary. Here's the first three stanzas, or first two stanzas of a, a very long poem, which actually was published as late as 1944, right? Okay. It's called Excelling the Starry Splendor of This Night. Now, it's not sort of like sort of like grooving on the stars above, right? It's not kind of like, you know, how I, how I love the stars or astronomical phenomena. It's excelling the starry splendor of the night. Very Victorian, right? I mean, and it goes on. I'll try not to get too hortatory, but it is kind of hortatory. Right? Excelling the starry splendor of this night, 
what link and lash that binds my bones I think of now amazed whose uh, there's no punctuation so I'm already lost what link and lash that binds my bones I think of now amazed whose hinge was even in seed articulate huh you know um, it's kind of um, but he's what he's doing here I'll just read the next one or even on this sharp and dreadful edge of death my eyes lift up and see against the tug and tangent of our going the scented stars right slow wheel the crackling heavens hung within the pinpoint of an eye my ear is sensible and hauls archaic music in its round right now and the real I can only I can only console you if you find that totally incomprehensible you're not the only one you know it's kind of it's kind of it's um what he's doing there right okay is he's imitating he's obviously imitating a number of um, late Victorian poets one is obviously Gerard Manley Hopkins right you know excelling the starry splendor of this night what Lincoln lash that bind what Lincoln lash is an exclamation what Lincoln lash that binds my bones right well Lincoln lash that binds I can get what the link is but what's the lash you know like uh, so but the the repetition of the L's you see he's into kind of uh, regular repetition and half rhymes right and they all sort of mingle up together and he's getting that from Gerard Manley Hopkins who was the master of that right and and he's also getting it from um, you know Anglo-Saxon poetry there's Anglo-Saxon poetry in that right and a lot of his early stuff you know uh, certainly the first book right you know the the I think it's the golden ball and I'm missing that up with Henry James's novel is full of that stuff you know you'd have to send it you would need a Captain Midnight codograph to decode it you know so but he begins to kind of get a bit better you see and um, but the thing he's struggling against here you see is that he's not only he essentially and, and this is where um, you know the um, the scholar who, who I, I, is, is uh, I studied him a lot, you know, um, not not call, but um, oh, my brain is going. I'm getting, a, I'm, I'm I'm losing my touch, folks. Um, it'll come, it'll pop. I've got it. It'll come later, anyway. A scholar who was studying him closely uh, talks about colonial anxiety. You see, that's the problem, and of course, it still exists today in Canada, right? So ultimately, the two great they're sort of kind of the two bullies on either side of you if you're a Canadian poet, right? So on the left, it's the English, or was the English, very much so, right? And, and certainly that was very much true until the, until the 1950s. And in fact, uh, uh, to the degree that he was trying to modernize himself, Gustafsson was not only uh, influenced by English poets of the 19th century, but he's also influenced uh, by uh, Dylan Thomas, an English poet of the 40s and 50s, right? You know, as late as the 40s and 50s, you know. So the language, you know, sort of, you know, uh, uh, the, the convoluted language is also to some degree Thomas-like. But of course, as I said, the two bullies on either side of you as a Canadian poet are the English, and then there's the American, right? You see, you see. So, so the English. You might characterize English poetry as characterized by order, right? Sort of kind of. At least it certainly was traditionally. It's changed now. You know, the American poet is poetry is not translate uh, characterized towards by the propensity for um, aesthetic order, but by the propen for for liberty, freedom, right? I mean, when you think of, for example, Tennyson, right? You know. You know, which is sort of like, I mean, it's quite wonderful, but it's very ordered, regular. Then you think of Whitman, right, sort of, and Whitman sort of kick out, the, you know, kick out the blocks, right? So you, you really get that sort of, that, that, that um, opposition. And, and he, he was sort of kind of, he was coming into Canada, and Canada, remember, was in, uh, at that time, I still is, arguably, a very conservative Place, right? At least English Canada was a very conservative place, and um, and and struggling to find its own voice, right? And unduly influenced by English poetry. I mean, it's a colonial anxiety, 
and replacing it or trying to find something new and sort of ending up very much, and here I'm digressing a bit, with American poetry, right? So, for example, if you update yourself and look at the, the major sort of aesthetic art struggles of the 60s and 70s, you know, the, the critique of um, the more regular poetry in Canada, the critique directed at it was it was academicist, right? And, it, and the implication was it was sort of stuck with England. You know, they're running like the English, they've got tight you know what's, you know, right? And they were trying to, the poets there, the so called Tish movement, which I mentioned last time, shit backwards, right? The Tish movement was trying to break out of that, and their primary influence was the Black Mountain School from the United States and the San Francisco Renaissance and the Beats, right? So, you know, you could argue, yes, they were overthrowing the colonial tradition, but you can also argue, and it has been argued, yeah, by adopting the American tradition, right? So it's the same thing, you see. A lot of truth to it, a lot of truth to it, right? So here we have, here we have uh, uh, Gustafsson trying to navigate between these two traditions, and there's no way he could avoid them, but he has to come up, trying to come up with a Canadian voice, which is somewhere in between. Right? And, and arguably, arguably, according to some, he did that, right? What he did, instead of coming up with, you know, um, order, or coming up with freedom, you know, or instead of coming up with formality or informality, he came up, at least according to some, with a synthesis, a synthesis of informal formality. And I guess you can switch it, right? Formal informality, right? There's some truth to that. There's some truth to it. But his stuff is, uh, his stuff nevertheless is pretty, um, pretty um, obtuse. And the language is, I mean, it's brilliant. It's brilliant, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, this guy can really uh, uh, use his language, employ language. But it's arguably still a little bit sort of, the varnish is a bit thick at times, right? It's a bit too genteel, you know, sort of kind of, you sort of feel that the part's a bit too straight, you know, like, uh, but uh, anyway, I'll see if I can demonstrate that. What is, inter is interesting was whereas his, the turn in his poetry, at least according to some critics, occurs about 1980, right? That's when he, as they, to use an expression which is entirely inappropriate here, that's when he began to loosen his girdle, right, you see. And uh, prior to that, it gets pretty, uh, it's still pretty, um, um, pretty, pretty um, encrusted, is that the right word, okay? Here's one called O permanent pain periclean. Now I think that's satirical. I think it's satirical, but still, you know. There, acronychal the marble and marble, more harmony than rivet ever drove to the Parthenon. Now I think he's serious too, you know. I mean, whew, you know, this is like uh, men with their damned wars blew it up. Well, they argue that's pretty idiomatic. That's colloquial, right? You see? Okay. What wigs and willows man bequeaths and bungles. Okay, so that, you know, he's obviously to some degree making fun of the language now. And he does hear, he says, Brahms, bongos, pitched out latex. So he's sort of making fun of it, but you sort of feel that he's still got one foot in the mire there, linguistic mire. And, um, and that continues. And uh, the other thing which is interesting and it's a very important current, is that along with his, his difficulty in finding a voice, and along in sense within his difficulty in kind of, how shall we put it, not turning his back on, but synthesizing with something else the English, uh, 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 English uh, tradition of, of, of aesthetic order, he also does not write about here, right? You see, because to some degree, He's a country, I mean, this is my version, he's a country boy with a bit of a, a bit of an inferiority complex, right, you know. And, uh, and sort of kind of, you read his first 30 years of poetry, and he never even mentions the eastern townships. 
and he rarely mentions Montreal. And he, he and he travelled. He just travelled all the time. He I mean he got positions. He went to you know he went to uh, when he was in London he was going all over Europe. We were just talking about the Acropolis. He was going to France. He was writing about all of the traditional sort of you know uh, uh, to, uh, to, tour, tourist uh, sites you know the uh, uh, of Europe you know and he wrote a bit, he, he was he was totally um, uh, in, submerged in high culture high culture you know all the time and one gets the impression he's sort of kind of he, he's I don't think he was I knew I knew him you know because I knew him much later on he wasn't a snob he was just sort of interested in that. And I think that, like a lot of, um, well, I mean, actually, Canadians, generally speaking, right, you know, because uh, not so much as he was, you know, even to the 1930s and 1940s, didn't write much about Canada either, you know. They, they, they wrote about England, right? And, and you'll notice, for example, though it's changed a lot, you'll notice that, you know, the reflex of many Canadians and Angela's had this, and she's been teaching uh, a creative writing, right? The reflex of many Canadians writing poetry is not to write about where they are. You know, they just don't do that because it, they feel it's not interesting. It's not storied, right? And it isn't storied because they haven't written stories, right? It's not mythologized, right? And, uh, and I think that's why he was sort of this internationalist, right, who didn't seem to realize somehow that somehow maybe where he came from was interesting, right? But he begins to be that way about 1980. He begins to actually, instead of sort of writing highly intellectual stuff in what you might refer to as a romantic Victorian language or, or influence language, right, and writing about the great themes, right, and expostulating, and when I say expostulating, conceiving poetry to something in a pre-modernist sense, where poetry is a sort of form of exalted utterance, right? Where you always get the impression that the poet, when they're, when they're, when they're writing the poem, is sort of stepping up onto a chair, you know, standing up on a chair or something, on a dais, right? You see, they're rhetoricizing, right? Sort of, uh, he stops doing that about the 1980s. And the poem that... <coughs> The, the first poem, uh, which, you know, uh, critics sort of suggest, right, uh, he, he, he did this, right, he actually took a look at where he was, right, is Quebec winter scene. It still has um, some of the um, um, uh, entanglements of syntax, though. You'll find yourself, I find myself when I read it, not knowing when a sentence ends and when a sentence begins. Quebec winter scene. Ralph, I'm speaking honestly, Ralph. You know I love you, but I think it's necessary to talk about what's there. And I think you're a wonderful poet. I've always thought you're a wonderful poet, but I've always thought you've had, you know, these have been some of the challenges of your poetic route. And the snow trodden round the yard, soiled with boots and fetched cordwood, straw raveled near the barn the long snow of the fourfold land. At dusk, acres clamped with coal, threshold and clearing everywhere white to the distant scribble of alders. Across the frozen fields, snake fence like charred music, sky only harvest, helps over buckled with taste of tin, Dipper icy, a man drinks gra gasping. Sweat of warm barn work, a hazard. Once out, door to, headed for house. At eight, night now pitch. The train halted for mail sacks at the swung lantern. The far horizontal, a moment, a history happening. The hills, alongside pants, monstrous, pistons poised, then pulls past. At the cutting, heard, warm, I don't know what the next word is because I mistyped it. At the cutting, heard, heard, warn, warning, heard, warning, whose only answer is the local heart. Okay. Now, there are moments there where you can actually 
feel, taste things. You see that? For example, and the snow trodden round the yard. This is my own exegesis. And the snow trodden round the yard. I get that. I like that. It's physical, right? It's kinetic, right? Soiled with boots and fetched cordwood. That's you know specific, physical, kinetic, right? You know, was it Ortega y Gasset said the poet is the the prof, uh, the poet is the physicist or the professor of the five physical senses, right? Straw raveled near the barn, you know, it's physical, right? The long snow of the fourfold yard, fourfold land. I don't know about fourfolds, you know. The modernist in me cringes at that one, you know. I mean, can you actually go up to somebody and sort of say, look at the long snow of the fourfold land? They probably think you were balmy, right? Like, uh, the la it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong, but the language, it's, the diction has been jacked up, it's inflated, right? We're getting back to Victorian rhetoric, right? Okay, at dusk, acres clamped with cold. Great, great, you see. Now maybe the preceding line with its sort of kind of rhetorical flourish is intentional. What he's doing now is he's combining the two, right? It's now becoming informal formality, right? And I think that is to some degree what's happening, okay? Okay, threshold and clearing everywhere white to the distant scribble of the alders. Great. I stole it. It's wonderful. The scribble of the alders. Right? It's good stuff, right? And then the frozen field snake fence like charred music. Right? That's surreal, right? That's surreal. Sort of burnt up music, you know, with the kind of uh, on it. That's very good, you know. See, now he's actually moving into a little bit of a old Andre Breton there, right? So, kind of, so it's, it's not 19th century Victorian, right? And then he goes on. Then he's got a man, dipper icy, a man drinks gasping. He's actually physically witnessing. He's witnessing the real world, right? And then dropping down, then he begins to, he begins to, in my view, sag a bit into a, a abstraction. A little, uh, at eight, night, I like this bit, at eight, night now pitched the train, halted for mail sacks at the swung lantern, the far horizontal, a moment, okay, the train halting for mail sacks, right? I mean, that's not poetic, you know, I mean, you know, that's, that's not 19th century, right? You know, that's not about eagles and mountain crags, right? But then he's got the swinging lantern, which is great, because that kind of, that's a kinetic movement in the scene. That helps you picture it, right? But then he sort of goes off and says, okay, a moment, the far horizontal, that's the horizon. He doesn't say the horizon, right? The far horizontal. At this point, he's sort of pumping the gas in a bit, right? He's inflating it. You know, a moment, a history happening, the hills, okay. He's waxing now, he's waxing, he's up on the chair, right, waving his arm, right. Then he goes down, alongside, then he gets back to it, alongside pants, monstrous, this is the train, pants, monstrous, not trousers, by the way. Pistons poised, then pulls past, we're back in the real world again, right. Then, you know, at the cutting, the railroad cutting, heard warning, Who's, okay, then the final line, whose only answer is the local heart, which I guess means, right, I mean, that's very rhetorical, right? Uh, what was that, Ralph? Would you repeat that again? You know, whose only answer, whose only answer is the local heart. What he's saying there, right, and to some degree, he's, he's talking about his new aesthetics. He's saying, you know, that, that it's, things here, right? The local heart, right, is the person here observing what's in front of him and finding the universal through what's in front of him instead of talking about the universal and using what else is out there as illustrations of the universal, you see. And in a sense that's what he's talking about. He's saying you got to... Poetry is in things, things, you know. It's not up there, right? Okay. But of course, in his final rhetoric, he sort of uses the language from up there, right? You see. So, in a sense, that's a kind of um, a transitional poem, which sort of arguably still contains the flaws of his preceding sensibility, right? You know, his sense of identity and his sense of response. On the other hand, you could argue that it is an effective synthesis between the two. He's working to do that, right? And I'll just read you, I've been going on for quite a while, I'll read you a much later poem where it, it's almost completely um, 
modernist now, right? But it still has a trace, you know. I won't call it of limp-wristed Victorianism. I, I won't call it gentility, but it certainly is refinement, you know. Okay, so Wednesday at North Hatley. It snows on this place, and a gentleness obtains. The garden fills with white. Last summer's hedgerow bears a burden, and birds are scarce. The grosbeak, the grosbeak fights for seeds. The squirrel walks the slender wire. There is victory. The heart endures. The house achieves its warm, and where he needs to, a man in woolen mitts, in muffler, without a death wish, northern walks. Except he stops at drifts. He cannot hear this snow. The wind has fallen, and where the lake awaits, the road is his. Softly the snow falls. Chance is against him, but softly the snow falls. Now this is interesting too, because it's a combination of both. It snows on this place. You know, I mean, that's plain song, right? That's, that's William Carlos Williams, you know. That's how people talk, right? Well, they don't say it snows on this place, you know. It snows here, right? It's slightly elevated, isn't it? Okay. And the gentleness obtains. It's lovely, but it's sort of kind of a bit sensitive, isn't it? You know, kind of, it's, it's, it's genteel. You know, I can't sort of say, you know, like, yeah, well, I, I can't come up with a, a more idiomatic line. The garden fills with what? Declarative, vernacular, bears a burden and birds are scarce. Okay, so he's playing there. Bears a burden and birds are scarce, right? But we'll give it to him. He's alternating between, you know, fancy, dancy, right, and plain speech, right? The gross beak fights for seeds. The squirrel walks his slender wire. What's the word that jumps at you? Slender, isn't it? It's not thin wire. It's a slender. It's a little. Obviously, he's he's playing with the s's. The squirrel walks. It's slender wire. Susurrance, right? So we'll let him have. There is victory. Then he contrasts that with a kind of an exclamatory, fairly hard thing. The heart. Oh, we're getting fancy again. The heart endures. Right? Play the violins, you know. So play the English horns, right? So okay. So we're we're jacking it up again, right? Okay. Probably intentionally. The house achieves its warmth, and where he needs to, a man in woolen mitts and muffler, well, we're back to, that's kind of good, you know, that's the train stop again, right, that's kind of, you know, the, uh, okay, in muffler without a death wish, northern walks, okay, so he's getting a little bit sort of, exp ex ex he's expatiating to some degree there, okay, except he stops at drifts, he's back again, except he stops in drifts, he cannot hear this snow, the wind has fallen, and where the lake awaits, the road is his. So he's pretty standard. The lake awaits, not lakes, not not lake waits for him, right? You see, lake awaits is a bit more highfalutin than waits for him, right? Okay, the road is his. Softly the snow falls. Well, he's getting you know poetic, and then this chance is against him. You know, now the first time I read this twenty years ago, I thought. There's no casinos in North Halley. I didn't get that. But what he's talking about is he's saying that, you know, in the human life, you know, the odds are against you. In other words, you don't live for very long and you don't know what's going to get you in the end. Chance is against him, but softly the snow falls. But there is the beauty of the world and of snow. So you can see he's sort of oscillating in his mature stuff. He's oscillating between this sort of, you know, the, the kind of the, the rhetoric the rhetoric and the exhortations of Victorian romantic poetry and kind of modernist plain song, and sometimes very effectively indeed. But you can see why he would really rub the high modernists the wrong way. They'd sort of say, you know, why don't you talk English for, you know, and, and whereas, of course, if you're kind of inured in Victorian and romantic poetry or, or appreciate to some degree your Shelley, your Keats, which is what he wrote his master's thesis about, right, you would say, Oh, that's beautiful, you see. So, that's Ralph Gustafsson, right? He's, he's kind of not bipolar, he's bi-aesthetic, you see. And, and, he's, uh, and he's a country boy who sort of kind of 
became sophisticated initially the wrong way, you might say, right? And then learned ultimately a path between two sophistications, America, uh, English sophistication with a capital S, right, and American sophistication, which were called, was sort of an anti-establishment, you know, it was, you know, uh, against the English sophistication, European sophistication. I hope I did you justice, Ralph. Uh, He's a, very, he's a very charming, very charming guy, extremely charming, very gentle manners, very gentle manners, you know, and uh, he, he was very absent-minded, you know, at least he was with me, because he was never sure who I was, and uh, I, uh, at one point, at one point, uh, I met him, I think I was at a poetry reading in North Hatley, and I went up to him, and I started talking to him, uh, and he said, ah, oh, Steve, he said, and there was somebody standing with him, I don't know who it was, some other poet from Montreal, and he said, this is Steve, he was my most brilliant student. I was never his student. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and whether I was brilliant would be questionable. And of course, needless to say, you know, like I needed a little steam in my self-esteem, so I, I didn't deny it, you know, I played it for a while. And then I think the next time I saw him, he denied, he identified me as something else, right? And and then I was told later that he was, uh, he had a very kind of, um, a very absent-minded, you know. But on the other hand, in terms of his teaching, he taught Ezra Pound's cantos. Apparently he was not absent-minded when it came to Ezra Pound's cantos, which interestingly enough, when you think about it, were very, very different <clears throat> in their early revolutionary uh, direction from what he was writing in England. Uh, maybe one of the the reasons why he taught the cantos, right, was to sort of try to train himself, right, out of out of sort of late Victorian poetry. I don't know, but um, also he was a musician. You realize he was a mu classical music critic uh, for the CBC and had a wonderful, a huge LP collection. And his particular specialty was classical piano. His dad uh, played piano, and he played a little. I never saw him play piano, but his poetry is much influenced. Uh, by his music. And he met, when he was in New York, apparently, he um, met many of the great pianists of the period, right? And there are several poems 
written to some of the great pianists. Louis Dudek said he was a name dropper because he wrote poems, and poems about these world famous pianists. But apparently he did meet these world famous pianists when he was in New York with his wife Betty. And here's a final note touchy, irrelevant note. I have about 20 or 30 of his books of poetry. He wrote about 40. And um, in fact, it was River, Rivers Among Rocks. I picked up this copy, which I don't even know where I got it. And um, I may have got it at the Black Cat Bookstore. And this is 1960. But I picked this up, and out of it dropped a note. And uh, and the note was uh, dated, uh, uh, I think it's September 1995, and it was written by his wife Betty. And it was thanking, it came along with this book, which was sent to a friend, Louise Voissard, Lennoxville, and the note from Betty was written after the death of, of Ralph, and, 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 and saying that she was having a difficult time now that Ralph was gone. And, uh, and, but she was sending Louise a copy of this book. Very sad to know. I've got it at home. I didn't even know I had it. So anyway, Betty was American, by the way, a nurse. Yeah. So was he a good poet or not? <laughs> well, you know, he, that's a very good I mean, who knows? I mean, obviously, he was a good poet. Whether he will last, whether his stuff will last, you know, one never knows, does one? You know, and not only that, what does last mean? Last means having a couple, you know, a couple of poems and, you know, an introduction to poetry for college or for high school. That's what it means, like two or three poems, right? Which people who are interested in, like, poetry remember, you know? think about it. I mean, so, I mean, I, I guess that's, that's something. I guess that's something that's remembered, isn't it? You know, I mean, who built this gazebo? You know, like, uh, I mean, ultimately, we're all rendered anonymous by history, aren't we? You know, um, but um, he's in the anthologies. In fact, uh, he produced the first Canadian anthology, you know, for Pelican Books. Uh, uh, anthology of Canadian Poetry for Pelican Books. I have a copy of it. I found a copy of it. It must be probably worth at least 20 bucks. The Anthology of Canadian Poetry compiled by Ralph Gustafson. And uh, it's, I think this one is, it has some odd selections, I'll tell you that. This one is um, 1942. Do you have one in the library? I don't think so. No, no okay. I maybe I should get Maybe we should get this one to the library because I doubt there's very few left. Yeah. And there's a picture. Of, he's quite a quite a handsome young man, you know. Um, and uh, so um, I don't know if he was at, living in the United States. Uh, I think it was in England when he put together this. Is the uh, first uh, anthology, 20th century modernist anthology of of English poetry. Um, so so I mean. He was um, well known, very well known. Apparently, towards the end of, it, I mean, he won all of the big awards. You know, the Governor General's Award, the, you know, the uh, Citizenship Award, whatever they call it. You know, and all of those things. And you know, and um, but apparently, towards the end of his life, um, he, um, which is hard for me to believe because I never saw this side of him at all. He was somewhat embittered, right? at the, uh, the lack of um, recognition, uh, or the lack of a sort of recognition, I think he felt he, he desired or he, he, he wanted. Um, and I suspect he felt that um, he, he, he was getting, uh, I'm guessing here, slagged a bit for being an old f aesthetic fuddy-duddy, you know, not, not being up to date, you know, not being hip enough. Uh, I don't know. Um, though he received the official awards, um, and I remember, this is a kind of a, a dark little note, I remember being in Toronto, and I went to this um, storefront uh, poetry um, uh, store run by a very brilliant but eccentric guy, he was about my age at the time, this was 30 years ago, 
who, who, who apparently went bankrupt very quickly, who was a real advocate of the Black Mountain group, group and the Beats and the San Francisco uh, Renaissance and all of that, the West Coast Tish movement. And in fact, his whole store was full of this stuff. And this was really ideological, you know. The battles between schools and poets, you know, are sort of kind of like, you know, you know, as I think it was somebody said, there's no, there's no fight like there is between groups of powerless individuals, you know, and that was what it was. And, uh, and I think my, I think I mentioned, maybe not last time, I'm going to use a dirty word on screen. My, my friend, uh, my, my teacher, my mentor, W.D. Snodgrass in the United States, sort of says, you know, that, that, that the difference between um, a, a, a school of poets, right, is a bunch of assholes who live on the same block who can only agree on one thing, that the other poets on the next block are a bunch of assholes, you know. And, and there's a, that could go to human beings generally, couldn't it? And there's a lot of truth to that. And the Black Mountain Group, I mean, their position you know, in terms of the, the Tisch Group was that somebody like, somebody like uh, you know, um, Gustafsson was sort of like some sort of you know, old fogey, you know, some sort of limp-wristed old fogey or something like that. Anyway, this, this guy who ran the bookstore, right, he was a real idiot. Like, I told him I knew uh, Ralph Gustafsson. He sort of froze and looked at me and he said, oh, you do, do you? I said, yes. He said, and did he ask you to kneel and kiss his ring? I, I was just shocked by that statement. You know? And I mean, <laughs> you could see, you know, like, I, I, certainly that was no, no, no Gustafsson that I had ever seen or heard of. But you can see that, that the subtext of that is that this guy has power that I don't approve of and I think I should have power or my group should have power, right? So you can see there was this kind of, kind of, bitter sort of um, squabble, you know, between um, <clears throat> these groups of uh, schools of poets, as there are in almost every other group, you know, psychiatrists and, you know, architects. And, um, and in, I think within that context, he felt that what well, Dudek, I told you last time, interestingly enough, was to some degree embraced by the West Coast group, right, for his long poems, right? you know, long culture poems, which are poundish, right, because Dudek, as I told you, was the secretary of Pound at St. Elizabeth Hospital. But Eileen Collins, Dudek's wife's response to the fact that Dudek had essentially been embraced for his long poems by the Tisch group was, you know, I wouldn't um, respect those if I were what I'm paraphrasing. She was sort of like, Ugh. she didn't like them. Right? So, so kind of, you know, there was sort of, you could see it was kind of sort of hostile, you know. So I think, once again, to repeat myself, within that context, I think that uh, Gustafsson thought that he was being dissed, you know, by uh, a lot of, you know, uh, poets in Canada for being an old fogey when he didn't think he was an old fogey at all. But I'm guessing. Probably guessing right, you know. <laughs> Curious. I have a sort of general question as a relative newcomer here, because that's I guess you, you mentioned it last time too. This idea of Canadian poets caught between America and uh, Great Britain. Who do you think are the Canadian poets who have most successfully staked out new territory that is neither? Well, I think they are doing it a bit more now. Anyway, I, th I think that I don't think I don't think among young poets. And I, being an old guy, I'm not totally up to date with the young ones because there's an awful lot of them, you know. I don't think, I think that that, that conflict has, um, I think it's sort of, sub, I don't know if it's subsided as such. I think it's kind of, it's sort of kind of spread, grown more flexible and various within each of those particular factions, right? So... Um, and also American poetry itself is much less ideological. You know, I, if you pick up the latest American anthologies, you know, I, I, I'm not completely up to date with the last 10 years, but, but you don't sort of, I don't think that East-West thing is, except you're my age or, or younger, is, they, they don't shout and scream at each other like mm -hmm. so much. And, and it's, you look and pick up the New Yorker, right, you know, 
you know, which was once, I think, a, a bastion of kind of academicist, conservative, you know, Northeastern American poetry. In fact, at times it's quite, uh, it runs the mill, you know, you've got some fairly various stuff there, you know. Um, um, so I think that, I think that almost, well, I guess I'm saying I don't think it's quite as relevant as it was anymore, yeah. Yeah. But what is the Canadian identity then? Well, that's a very good question. Is what is the Canadian? <laughs> is that identity? only one? <laughs> that's a very, very good question, isn't it? I mean, that's Not where D. G. Yeah, that's where D. G. Jones comes in, right? Where his book, you know, uh, oh, right. Butterfly on Rock, the notion that the Canadian identity, which of course has been contested, everything is contested, right? The is the Canadian identity emerging from Canadian history, a history very different from the United States because of the nature and the structure of the settlement of Canada was completely different, uh, is, is, is a much more um, uh, conservative, uh, but not politically conservative necessarily, culturally conservative, right? Actually, it's politically less conservative, but culturally conservative, um, cautious, cautious, um, 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 uh, uh, kind of reflective, reflective, and, and, and even even at times uh, a reclusive identity because essentially it's it's kind of a, it's kind of you know Montaigne or is it Montesquieu? I think it's Montaigne. It's because in the uh, among other things a cold environment led to you know a a, a cold living uh, living you know uh, which was you know whereas Americans are sort of out there in their wagons pushing forth, you know, in what is essentially, for the most part, you know, a fairly fertile, apart from the poor old Indians who have to get sort of, you know, slaughtered, for fertile, welcoming environment, right? You know, not all of it, obviously. It means what you mean by welcoming. Canada was like a push into this kind of sort of, you know, like three-month growing season, you know, and uh, so, you know, whereas the Americans were concerned with revolution, if you will, and uh, Canadians are concerned with insulation and renovation, right, the kind of, you know, like, you know, we're still trying to keep warm all the time, and I think there's some truth, I mean, it's kind of, it's an attractive and kind of, you know, and reductive theory, but it's, I think there's a lot of truth to it, you know. Um, Actually, in, in parts of New England, for example, in Minnesota, actually where the New Englands and the New England artists have the most affinity to Canada, you'll notice they have very similar reflexes. They're kind of a Vermont, you know, that's why they're such a close thing. So, so I think that, I mean, certainly you can assert that, right, as, as part of the Canadian identity. The England is no longer, and hasn't been since the 40s, you know, you know, uh, uh, culturally a great influence. I say it still is an influence, not a great influence, right? And the United States is still a great influence, um, but not, I think, as strong as it was, you know, um, because Canadian American poetry is also extremely diverse now, too. Um, I mean, one of those anthologies way back when, Hayden Carruth edited it, who actually taught just after I left Syracuse, that the voice that is great within us talked about American poetry essentially being a poetry for many different regions, right? And um, so American poetry is not so monolithic anymore. And also, of course, I think the notion of regions is stronger in Canada, too, that they, you have poetry from different regions. So the, 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 I think Canadian poetry is, as I say before, it reflects that conservative kind of reaction to a, a harsh climate, insulation and renovation, not revolution, and at the same time, I think it's um, become increasingly regional. Yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I hope that's a coherent, it's probably really dead wrong, you know what I mean, but it's a, it's a kind of... Uh, well, now that I know that Canadian poetry is largely concerned with insulation, it makes me look at the last stanza of one of the poems that will be published in our little bilingual anthology where your poem, in this frost-spiked room, momentarily immune from the cold, I envision and hear them, like the wild things wintering in my walls, my dreams eat the insulation. Now I see that in a different context now. Yeah, 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 except, except I love the outdoors. Uh. <laughs> that's yeah, also that's a little plug for the fact that we will, at some point this fall, be coming out with a little... Yeah, uh, yeah, translation of uh, Unfortunately, my chapter. French... My French is not good. Apparently, they're very good translations. Yeah. My French is not good enough to, 
You know, I can understand it, but I can't pick up the uh, connotations and any of that sort of stuff, you know. That's too bad, you know, I'd like to. You know what I've always wanted to do? You know, you remember the, uh, the party game where you whisper something in somebody's ear, and then they whisper it in the next guy's <laughs> ear, and it goes around the circle? I would like to have one of my poems translated in French, have the French poem taken translated in English, and have it go to about 12, and see how it comes out the other end, right? It could be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, a number of them are up on the library's website if you guys haven't seen them. Uh, we have a really uh, skilled translator named Marise Laplante who lives yeah, in Manusville, yeah. um, and they will be coming out in book form at some point. So. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. So that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why, why did he write at all? Why did he write at all? Why? I don't know the answer to that one. Why does one write? I once created a scene, you know, at a writing conference where there was a seminar on detective writing. Because well, that's very, you know, the townships, right? Louis Penny. And there were all these detective fiction writers. And I say, why do you write about murder all the time? You know, like, uh, and I meant that as an interesting, I meant that as a scholarly question, right? You know, I mean, I mean it's very interesting and the formula is very interesting. And, but why do you do it, you know? I mean, because probably you've never visited, you've never actually been to a murder, right? In fact, you've never supposed spoken to a policeman about a murder. It's ultimately, most detective fiction writers just read detective fiction, right? And they just recreate, recycle detective fiction conventions. But the question then becomes beyond the interest of detective fiction, as I've heard it described as a, and I can never pronounce this word, as a radiocinative form, i.e. it's cerebral writing. Who did it? You know that. Why do you write it? You know, and uh, and the guy thought I was accusing him of being sort of you know unhealthily obsessed with homicide, and they all got really mad at me. You know, and I I didn't say this, and I I should have stood up and run from the room and said, "Leave me alone, you, you know, you murderers or something like that." But he, he he didn't know. And in terms of poetry, in terms of your question. Um, I don't know, I think it's when you're I'm responding myself to it. It's like, why are you interested in economics? You know, like, I think maybe when I was a kid, you know, I read poems in primary school, and they kind of rang bells in me or something, you know, and so I wanted to, I wanted to do it. You know? I don't know, it's a mystery, isn't it? I must, in terms of, uh, I don't think, um, his, his dad, you know, Carl, I don't think he was any poets. I don't think he was a poetic family at all. I think he was a Swedish immigrant. Most of the Swedish immigrants that came in, there was a bunch of them that came in, I think, around 1880s or something. They were like yops, weren't they? Sort of working men. His mother was British. She was, yeah. His mother wasn't a Swedish, was she? No, I don't know. She was from Britain. She was, yeah. yeah. I don't know what her education was or anything. I have no idea. It's a, it's a Darwinian mystery, isn't it? Like a, but that's one of the, that's kind of wonderful, isn't it? That you could almost find somebody who's really interested in anything, can't you? And thank God they are, you know, because otherwise you wouldn't get your fridge fixed, would you? <laughs> you know, like, uh, it's, it's, it's a mystery. I, uh, 